So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Amit, and I'll be talking to you about uh, building next generation personalized search applications uh, on top of the Kiji framework, and I'll explain all of this. Um, I'm uh, currently a member of technical staff at a company called Weeby Data. We are founded by some folks from Cloudera and Google, specifically one of the Cloudera founders started Weeby Data. And um, so just a little bit about us. Um, this cartoon kind of sums us up, it summarizes us in a bit of a nutshell. Weeby Data helps build software to enable brands to personalize their user experience. So in other, in other words, um, you can see this lady you know, looking at a situation where customers who bought this also bought that. That's like the stereotypical example that we all know and love. Amazon popularized this in the you know, early 2000s. And there are many companies who want to be like Amazon but need not uh, be able to invest the uh, time, people, and money to hire out you know, multiple hundred or thousand person team. So WeB Data has built an open source infrastructure uh, a framework on top of Hadoop and HBase to make this possible. A little bit about myself, I'm a Virginia Tech grad, go Hokies. I moved up to Northern Virginia afterwards to work at Northrop Grumman, uh, defense contracting, a lot of Java middleware, got exposed to a lot of XML processing. Uh, 2008, I moved west to work at a startup called zevents.com which is an event search company helping you find things to do. This is where I got introduced to Solar Lucene later on into Hadoop. And uh, we have our own database called Hypertable, which is a big table clone. Uh, we got bought by eBay in late 2011. About two years later, I left and came to Weeby Data. So just a presentation outline. I'm going to speak to you a bit about the Kiji framework. Um, show of hands, has anyone heard of the Kiji framework before? Yeah, it's kind of what I expected. Uh, that's fine. I will give an overview of that. A little bit of a discussion on personalized search. Uh, Chris uh, Hostetter gave an excellent overview of, of this and probably explained that part better than I will. So that's great, because then at least if you don't remember what I'm saying, we well, can go look at his slide. And you know, I love segues like that. Further, finally, I'll give a demonstration application. I will hope it doesn't crash and burn. And then we can have Q&A and discussions afterwards. So what is Kiji? Kiji is a framework for building big data applications. It's open source, highly modular, and lightweight. And it allows you to store more, excuse me, store data more naturally, simplify your application development efforts, author and deploy predictive models, and score and rescore these predictive models in real time. So Kiji is built on a whole suite of open source technologies. It's built on top of Hadoop which gives you the HDFS and MapReduce capabilities to process large amounts of data. It's built on top of HBase, which gives you the low latency, real-time, key value lookups, as well as bulk processing and bulk loading of data on top of this. So the Hadoop HBase integration is very, very nice. And Avro, which gives you a schema and a sort of a serialization, deserialization, and representation of your data that you can store in HBase keeping in mind that HBase only deals with bytes um, on the puts and gets and scans. Avro gives you a little bit more um, higher level data storage. So this diagram kind of gives the Weeby Data Kiji ecosystem. At the very high level, at the very top, mouse, ah, OK. At the top, you've got your applications. This might include web applications. Uh, typically, I'd say web applications, you know, you want to make an e-commerce site to do real-time recommendations, you make a request into a REST, app, REST server that Weeby Data provides. On the other side of the house, so to kind of summarize this, we have, there's two main audiences. You can view analysts on one dimension and uh, web application and, and application developers on another dimension. Analysts care about interfacing through databases, through Hive, Mike, maybe MicroStrategy, R, Tableau, all of these technologies maybe through JDBC and Hive on, on one side. You've got analysts who care about predictive models, data scientists who care about authoring, maybe collaborative filtering, association rule mining, those type of uh, typical data science applications. And then you've got your web application developers, the integration folks, the guys who are going to take your REST interface and code it up to hook up to your website. So all three of those, I, I think I said two, I should have said three. All three of those, those dimensions are captured at Weeby Data and, and Kiji in particular. And at the bottom, you've got all of your huge data stores. You've got social media, purchase history, browsing history, kind of geolocation, emails that have made, emails that have made, 
emails that may have been sent to customers and their interactions with it, um, real-time interactions, clicks, page views, impressions, et cetera. And those all get ingested and stored inside of Kiji. So the data model that, that we kind of espouse looks as follows. You basically have your typical column family, column qualifier kind of no notation in HBase. Um, rows are identified by an entity ID, which is slightly higher level than a row key. Because if you think about a row key, a row key is a string, or maybe actually more like a byte array, but, but let's say a string for simplicity. And if you want to have multiple components, multiple aspects of your row key, you probably have to concatenate them together and hope that they sort in the correct order. Well, with Kiji, with entity IDs, you can store your data with um, maybe a string to represent a user type and an ID along to represent the actual user ID. And those are two independent, distinct components that are typed. And they can be read and written typed and stored into HBase. And we, Kiji, take care of serializing it in a way that is sortable. Um, this is still the primary key. This is, this is, nothing has changed. HBase is still primary key. We have primary key. Columns are identified by a column qualifier. And um, so you've got maybe an info column family and a name as a qualifier. You've got maybe games as a column family. You have a qualifier that might be a byte array. But the one difference that we have in Kiji that is consistent with Bigtable but not consistent with HBase is a concept of locality groups. And locality groups simply give you the ability to clump together multiple column families so that they're co-located on disk so that you can read data faster and more efficiently as opposed to having to open up multiple file writers to multiple, multiple column families or multiple H files in HBase in particular. So this is, a, this is a big table concept that was kind of lifted and implemented at the Kiji layer. So that's why you'll see here a concept of locality groups. And in this diagram, we've got two locality groups, one that is more disk heavy, one that is more memory intensive. And the one that's more memory intensive, memory heavy, might be used for storing low latency, higher um, read volume recommendations that might be, that you tell HBase, keep this data in memory um, preference with a higher priority than others. So data is physically organized by locality groups, logically organized by column families, and stored using Avro. If there's any questions at any time, please uh, raise your hand and feel free to interrupt. Yes. Yes. So there is Avro RPC, but um, a lot of times when you look at Avro, like uh, Avro file formats, you'll actually have just a bunch of bytes with maybe a schema at the top saying this is what it is. And we have something similar where you have all the bytes are schema, are Avro. Another part that Kiji, you know, one thing we've talked about and we've implemented quite nicely is the concept of schema evolution. So traditional database applications, traditional relational applications, you want to change the schema for your application. You have to probably bring down your database, execute an, uh, an expensive alter table statement, and then bring back all of your applications consistent with that schema. With big data applications, they may evolve constantly. You may have a whole suite of different applications reading and writing to the same data store, evolving at different speeds. And the last thing you want to do is an expensive MapReduce job to uniformly process all of your old data and keep them consistent with a single schema. This is where Avro comes into play. Avro does support the concept of evolution of schemas. So you can uh, introduce new fields without breaking backwards compatibility with old fields. I believe protocol buffers has something similar. I'm not too familiar, familiar with it. But, but the, both of these types of systems, but Avro for what we use, allows you to add new fields because you can declare them as optional. So you have some default value when you read them back if you have an old application reading newer data. And we at Kiji, since we have access, since we're kind of a framework layer, we store all of the schemas that you could use to read and write data so that if you try to write data that does not conform to any schema that we recognize, we'll throw an exception. Therefore, you have no chance of having bad data in HBase if you use Kiji. So here's an example DDL statement that you can use with Kiji. Here I'm creating a table called users. Um, I've attached a description to it saying, well, this is my users table. I've declared my row key format. And this is the row key that I was describing to you earlier, the multiple component entity ID. And here, I only have one component, a long user ID. And um, I have one locality group. I'm going to make sure that it's, it has maximum number of time-stamped cells. So you know, just history is forever. 
Um, all the cells with a the timestamp, they live forever. I'm not storing them in memory. I'm using Snappy. And I have one column family called interactions. And these are user interactions with my website. And in this case, I'm only storing clicks. And the click is defined by an Avro record called click record. Now, one thing you'll notice is I've named my column families long names, long human readable names. Well, this is another feature that Kiji gives you that HBase may not necessarily give you out of the box, is a lot of times with HBase, because each cell contains a four tuple of column family, qualifier, value, and timestamp, it's to your advantage to store as few bytes as possible in the column family and qualifier, because you're repeating that information across all of your cells stored in HBase. We take care of that for you by keeping this table layout information and mapping human readable column names to HBase friendly actual names. So this column family in HBase is unreadable. It might be like a single byte. Uh, and that's OK, because again, you're using Kiji to read and write your data. But if you were to use the HBase raw APIs, this would look like garbage. Does that all make sense? Cool. So now the next thing, so now we move up the stack a little bit, and we're going to talk about Kiji Express. Um, have any of you used cascading or scalding to write MapReduce jobs before? OK. Um, so you know, as you know, MapReduce, you've got Map and Reduce. You've got various kind of higher level flows like high pig cascading, which allows you to author complex MapReduce jobs uh, as a workflow dealing with pipes and tuples. Scalding is a Scala DSL on top of that. And it's very friendly to uh, analysts, data scientists who might come from a Python or R background because it's functional. Uh, it's simple. It has a matrix API that allows you to think about your pipes as matrices. And you can, um, you can construct complicated MapReduce workflows and machine learning algorithms that are um, linear algebra-based using the matrix API. So as I mentioned, it allows you to simplify ML model development. It's a powerful matrix API to develop algorithms requiring linear algebra. And in Kiji, we've come, we've, we release with um, some pre-built building blocks, such as item set mining. So you, you can imagine a, a whole series of customers with a whole series of purchases, and you can derive association rules. Like people who buy butter, milk, and bread will probably also buy cheese. And standard collaborative filtering similarity measures, as well as locality sensitive hashing, which is the uh, implementation based on Twitter. So you don't have to read all this, but this is basically 30 lines or so of code to generate um, an item item similarity matrix based on TFIDF. And this will be in the slides. You can come back to it uh, later. And then, so the next thing I just want to quickly touch on is this notion of real time versus batch. So there are certain computations, I think Chris was mentioning uh, in his talk, there, that you want to compute in batch. So uh, item item similarities across your entire product catalog, association rule mining across all of your user purchase history. Uh, and in my case, categorical affinities based on all of the user ratings. Kiji provides <coughs> facilities for both. Kiji Express is what you would use for batch computation. And I'm going to talk about the real time here next. So Kiji scoring. <clears throat> when you request a column from HBase, in our case, we basically allow you to attach a, real, a read time trigger, which simply says, um, if something is out of date or, or some condition holds true, recompute recommendations based on other data in your column, in your row. So, for example, I might have a column called recommendations that's based on my previous movie ratings. And I'm going to merge that information with my categorical overall affinities, merge them together, and produce a set of search time boosts, which is precisely what I'm going to talk about. And I want to do that only if I've rated a new movie. If I've not rated a new movie, then whatever I've already computed and stored in HBase is sufficient for me to um, present back. So there's no point in recomputing. So we basically use HBase as a cache. Um, so some terminology is we have a concept of a freshness policy. It says, well, when do you trigger the re-execution? Maybe the recommendations are a day old. Maybe they're 15 minutes too old. You can say recompute. Or I've rated a new movie, recompute. A freshener is what actually executes the scoring logic. It basically says, OK, now that the freshness policy has been violated, trigger this piece of code, which will then actually kick off a call to a scoring function that says, given this user context, please give me back a new score. And the scoring function may or may not live in the same JVM. And, and, and that becomes important in, in a future slide. So the other part of Kiji stack is this con concept called the model repository. 
And this is what allows data scientists to come up with a new model, uh, come up with a training algorithm, come up with a real-time scoring, all of its dependencies, package it together, uniquely identify it in the ecosystem, and upload it to Kiji, upload it to a centralized place. In solar speak, this might be equivalent to a handler, where you define a new handler in solar config with all of the new boosts, all the new parameters, and then basically save it into solar config. This is sort of externalizing that into a separate repository that can get loaded at runtime. And it gets loaded at runtime by the scoring server. So the scoring server is another long-lived service that pulls the model repository and checks for new models to deploy and make available for scoring. And models are attached to columns according to this whole freshness policy. So now you can kind of see how this whole thing kind of fits together. It makes A-B testing fairly easy because you can just simply attach it to a new column inside of HBase and say redirect some portion of traffic to invoke that new column. And it allows for zero downtime deployment and undeployment. So unlike other things where I'm going to have to bring down my entire application, deploy this new machine learning model, bring it all back up, I can simply deploy my new machine learning model to this a separate piece of scoring logic that will um, make it available for me on the fly. So now let's put all this together. And again, you don't have to read this. This is all for when you uh, have insomnia, you're listening to my slides, listening to my talk, and you can view this at the same time. So you can, you can now see that on the left-hand side, you've got web applications, point of sale system, et cetera, or specifically the web app speaking to Kiji REST, which is the main entry point for, an, for a web application. Kiji REST, you're asking it, give me a set of recommendations for this user. In order to do that, it's going to call into our scoring infrastructure that says, please give me back for this user recommendations. And depending on uh, information that you know, it has, it will go back to HBase or other, other systems to merge the results together and present you back a set of results. And then, on, and then underlying all of this is our Kiji schema, which is, sits on top of HBase. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, you've got your analysts and data science tools, such as Hive, Express, and optionally, potentially, PMML. All right, so now I've set all this stage up. We're here for personalized search, so let me talk about that. Personalized search to me means that two known users searching for the same thing should see different, obviously personalized results. And as far as I can tell, there's two approaches. One, you execute the query as normal. You fetch the top, say, 1,000 results, 5,000 results. You then have this set in memory. You then run across all of those and re-rank based on some logic or some information that you may have. This, to me, works well if you only have access to uh, data on the way out. The other option is you modify the query going into the search engine so that you, you uh, push down the problem as far as possible. And it really only works if you have access to the inbound query. Okay? And of course, the second option was inspired by uh, Chris's talk a few years ago when I was at uh, a meetup, and I've been wanting to play with this ever since. So this is my chance. Yay. Um, I'm assuming we're all fairly familiar with solar, but just in case for anyone who's not, um, Customizable search engine sits on top of Lucene. Its biggest features, as far as I'm concerned, are you've got a schema definition, a REST API, distribution, caching, which is super important, and easy configuration for multiple search handlers, models, perhaps, in my world. Solar ranking, and this is important, is generally is expressed as a linear combination of features. And, and as some have said, it's a multiplication of popularity times relevance. And the dismax and the e-dismax handler gives you a natural language uh, query specification so that you can define what fields are used for matching um, for terms, for phrases, for underlying inherent document popularity that are independent of uh, text. So for example, when I was at Zevents, you know, event popularity was a function of artist, venue, time, distance. Uh, well, not so much distance and time. Well, time, but not necessarily distance. Those are inherent document scores that you can store independently of text. And of course, distance is a function of your current user context. So Dismax allows for queries like Tom Hanks to query across multiple fields, actor, description, title, tags, maybe user reviews, and rate and rank and weight each one of those fields based on your own 
uh, personal preference. You could use Cupid to determine how well your queries are doing and then adjust those weights accordingly and, and see those numbers go up. So now query modification. So the bottom line is you're going to take the original user query, modify it with some user preferences, which allows you to push down the whole personalization problem all the way down to the Lucene layer, because you're basically uh, executing all this at the scoring layer. And then, to me, that ensures optimum recall. And if you think about it, Solar kind of does some of this with synonym and query rewriting mechanisms anyways as part of the analysis pipeline. So specifically in my case, what I was trying to play with is I want to use categorical preferences for simplicity. Um, I want to look at, for a given user, their last X ratings, say 10 or 100, and use the um, distribution of categories to know what is their preference based on what they rated for a category or for a movie relative to the population. So if you've rated 10 movies in the past and 80% of them are drama, I figured you're interested in drama. Uh, now the next question is, well, how much more interested or less interested in drama are you than the average? And that is the formula that I'm talking about. And Chris talked about this in his talk about Z-score. Z-score is a measurement of how much above the standard, how many standard deviations above the average are you than, than normal. So concretely, if I were to take the last 10 ratings, organize them by category, and, and produce the average, this is my average user, re user recent rating. Subtract the global rating for that category and divide it by the standard deviation. This is important because this allows me to normalize, this allows me to produce a normal score across different, um, different, across different data sets that have different uh, numerical distributions, but at least I can now compare them and give it some, some sort of a sensible rating. So concretely, if a user's recent ratings for drama is an average of four, and everybody else gives it a four, well, then you're no different. You're average. But if your preference for drama is four, but the global average is two, then um, you're above the average. I need to boost drama for you. And that's, that's important here. So the formula that I employed is one plus the sum of each weight. And I only take three categories. So it's you know categorical weight one times the query for category one, weight two times category two, weight three, category three. And I have to add one so that if this is all zero, I don't get everything screwed up. And um, I'll show, so let's, let's look at an example for, for a minute. So I have a movie search system called FlixNet. <clears throat> and just to show that I'm not faking anything, I'll do a hard refresh. OK. So for a given user, ID 64107, random user, these are the recent ratings that they have given. And um, so we can see, OK, for this particular movie, which is, uh, oh, The Piano, gave it a rating of 5. And it's in drama and romance. And the average global rating is 3.67 and 3.55. So we know that this person likes drama and romance, for instance. And we do all of that. And we come down here. And this is basically a map that I store. At, this is an Avro record, a JSON, serial, J, JSON Avro record that says, oh, um, this person likes drama 0.16 you know, above average and uh, category two, which is romance, you know, 0.09 above average, and so forth. These boosts are what I would then take, apply them to a solar query using the stuff Chris was talking about, and get personalized results. And I'll show a demo here in a minute. So at the highest level, talking about how I integrate this with Kiji is as follows. I'm on my website. I've logged in. I search for a movie. I hit maybe some front end web app, comes into solar. It says user123 is querying for Tom Hanks. Cool. Comes in. Now, because of solar's component oriented framework, I've written a Kiji's query component that extends the search component or query component so that it, this is now my search component. It intercepts the query and it looks, is this person logged in? Yes, because I have a user ID specified. Cool. I'm going to intercept that request, go to using the Kiji scoring infrastructure and the scoring server, say, hey, Kiji, please give me the latest boosts for this user. Now, 
the scoring server might say, well, the last time I computed these boosts was a day ago. It's about time I recompute. So I recompute by going to HBase to fetch whatever information I need, recompute, recombine all of that, produce that Avro record I just showed you a minute ago, send all that back. Query component says, cool, I got my Avro record. I'm going to decompose it, reset the queue, reset the cats, reset the QQ, and all those funny variables that's in the query, shove all that down into Solar, Core, Lucene, all the good stuff, and then bring back the results. And so, so to do this more concretely so that you know, it's not just magic, you guys can do this eventually once I post all the code, I use the 10 million rating movie lens data set. I um, scrape IMDB a little bit to get some title and description because Movie Lens doesn't provide all of that. So it just makes the search a little bit more interesting. Index the title, description, actors, ratings, et cetera, into Solar. <clears throat> I execute a Kiji Express you know, script to process all of this information to construct uh, user information, rating information for those users, as well as category, global category information. And then a scoring function that will compute based on recent ratings and this categories table boosts. So now let's look at some examples so that it, this, this is hopefully more real. So, okay, so let's, let's just do a quick solar search for Adam Sandler. This is a non-personalized Adam Sandler search. It's not bad, you got eight crazy nights, anger management, big daddy, 50 first dates, so forth and so on. And now I'm gonna do a personalized search based on just some bogus user ID and to show that this is a clean user is let's look at okay so here we see I've got nothing there should be no information therefore theoretically uh, when I do a search for um, this user I should see the exact same results because there's nothing to boost. So great. So just to show. Now let's hypothetically say that this guy, this user, likes Big Daddy. So I'm going to rate that higher. Okay. So my UI is not the greatest, but now let's go and look at here, and we can see cool. I've rated Big Daddy a five. My average rating is a five. My rating is a five. The average is this. So if I were to execute a personalized search, I would expect these boosts to be applied to my query, okay? So now let's go and do a search for Tom Hanks. And I like Tom Hanks. These are the non-personalized generic results for Tom Hanks, Saving Private Ryan, Apollo 13, Castaway, Forrest Gump, Big, etc. Now let's do a personalized search. So I'm gonna take my user ID I'm going to go here and see, cool. I now see comedy movies coming up. Forrest Gump, Big, Toy Story, Turner and Hooch, Sleepless in Seattle, Toy Story 2, That Thing You Do, Joe versus the Volcano. Now, I mean, there are probably some more tricks and stuff I can pull to make this better. Uh, obviously, I read a single, I assume that you rate a movie with a bunch of categories, that you're equally rating all of those categories, not one of them. So in the situation of anger manage or Big Daddy, it's only a comedy. But because this is a flat hierarchy, this is a flat hierarchy. I assume that that rating is for all categories, which means that um, I am I am now asking Solar give me back movies with comedy as a category, not exclusively comedy as the category. If that makes sense, that's where you're seeing a lot of non you know comedy stuff as well. Um, so yeah, but. So we could probably turn on debug and see. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> if we were to come down to the bottom, we can see here. This is the boosts. So this is the boost that we applied, which is the comedy category and then multiplied by this boost factor, okay? And full screen. So where do you go from here? Well, 
first thing I encourage is to please visit www.kiji.org. You can download a bento box, which is an all-in-one distribution of all of our stuff, including Hadoop and HBase. So when you do bento start, it loads up an HBase cluster, a Hadoop cluster, Zookeeper, um, and all of these components I just described. Uh, I'm going to clean up my code and eventually post this on either my GitHub um, or something. I'll tweet this on Weeby Data's Twitter once it's done. Join the mailing lists at user and dev at kiji.org. And of course, follow Weeby Data at Twitter. Um, I have ended far too early, I think. So now is the time for lots of questions. So please, have at it. No, I don't do similar. I don't do user similarity. Just uh, so the question was for the audience: uh, Can I show similar users in this interface? And the answer is no. Um, right now, I'm just doing boosting based on preferences. Doug, what's the performance cost of going out to HBase for this information? Is it? Do yeah. You, and do you cache that at all in any way? Yeah, good question. So the question is, what's the performance hit of going to HBase and doing all of this? And the short answer is, I haven't measured this. I haven't done this at scale, so I haven't measured this out. However, um, if we go back to um, when I described Kiji scoring, one of the things that we do is cache at the HBase layer. So a lot of the requests, if we said, for instance, uh, don't recompute this whole boosting stuff unless the user has rated a new movie. So if the user has not rated a new movie, then presumably the values that you've kept in HBase is what you care about. So at worst, you're just reading from HBase. And if it's you know, cached at the HBase layer, it should be fairly fast. Um, but I haven't done. And actually, a more fundamental question is the, per the performance implication of running these query time boosts at Solar itself is non-trivial. And I think that's where you'd also have to do some caching. And I don't quite know how to invalidate the caches when something like this has been violated. I'd have to, we'd have to play with the hash code and stuff of a query. Well, I'll be around if there's Jack. Had, had you considered like a custom similarity or does that just uh, not change the picture really? So, um, I didn't, I didn't look at custom similarity. So that question is, did, did I consider a custom similarity? And the answer was no. And the only reason I want to do a custom similarity was uh, I, I wanted to reduce the amount of changes in the solar layer that I had to do. So the reason this is, this is sort of helpful is I could say to someone, keep your existing solar infrastructure intact. Here's a component that you can simply add to your query flow. And it will just sort of turn on personalization magically. Um, rather than kind of digging into the bowels of solar to change the custom similarity and all this other stuff. I want to keep all that the same um, so that I'm not mucking at that layer. Yes? Uh, when it comes to personalization and the categories, yes. how do you handle the situation new categories get introduced? And you know what I'm talking when about? You, when you, yeah, with data freshness, basically. So the question is, what, how, what do I do when, you, um, when new categories get introduced? And that's, that's a good question. So, so there's sort of two things, I guess. The one thing I didn't mention is, um, so there's two solutions. One is you just recompute in batch, the entire user item ratings system in batch to recompute all of this. Although, I think a more sane, sane approach is, so I didn't, I didn't show you a lot of the tables that I created. So if we look at the categories table that I mentioned, um, each time that a user submits a rating, I'm updating not only the user table to say, well, user X rated this movie. I'm also updating a categories table that says, for a given category, the number of ratings, the number of average, and all that sort of stuff is also being updated. So if we look, for example, so in your situation, if I'm adding a new category, what's going to end up happening is I'll end up creating a new row in HBase on the categories table. So for instance, here with entity ID, the category name is action. Um, these three fields, num ratings, sum ratings, and sum squared ratings, are the three minimum data points you need to calculate average and standard deviation. Okay. So as users rate a, a new category, you'll see a new entry with a fairly low number of ratings and sum and square, standard, sum squared. But over time, that will grow. 
So actually, the system doesn't have to go down when you add new categories because, because of HBase, you can dynamically add new rows, and it all flows through the system. Does that kind of answer the question? I'm worried about the situation. Nobody sees this new category. You, you need to somehow uh, sprinkle it in the results set so people start seeing it so they can rate it. Right. So, so the solution, so the question is, well, how, does, how do users see those new categories? Well, the answer really is keep your solar index more fresh. Because this, this isn't changing solar. This is still living on top of solar. So presumably, there's an indexing pipeline of new movies, hence new categories. And you're fasting on those categories or displaying those new categories. Um, all the information that I'm getting is from my solar index. So as long as my solar index is maintained in, uh, is fresh, then my category information will also stay fresh. Because presumably, I'm adding new movies and I'm adding new categories. So this becomes more of a content management problem than a typical search problem you would have anyways. Jenna. Um, actually, you confused me a little bit with that answer. Yes. Uh, what's in solar versus what's in HSpace? Yes. So, so, and in particular with, uh, Where's the data changing most rapidly in solar or HSpace? And then if, you, uh, if the data is changing behind the scenes in HSpace, mm -hmm. is there the, maybe you were asking the question earlier about, is there a way to then propagate to, ca that back. to cause the uh, caches to be refreshed because sure. the results would be different? Sure. So, so the question is, well, what's stored in HSpace versus what's stored in solar? Well, let's, let's take a quick look at my solar index. And let's see. So. Um, Oh, let's see if I can get to that. Nope. Nope. Um, hang on. OK, well, screw it. I'll just answer it. Basically, what's stored in solar is um, I'll show a 404. What's stored in solar is your, is your typical categories, name, title, description, actors. Maybe the basic popularity metrics like um, average ratings at the time of indexing, the movie release date, those type of query time aspects. So that allows me to do my basic faceted search. What's stored in HBase? Everything that is independent of the user, correct. Yes. <clears throat> What's stored in HBase, though, is uh, two things. One is uh, a user's information. So let's take a look at user's table. So, okay. So, so here we can see this particular user, 14, 1404. I have ratings. So I store all of, for a given user ID, all of their rating information and timestamp order. So this gives me that three dimensional data view, okay? And I was playing around with decayed ratings to figure out if I could do more better. Um, query relevancy. But the bottom line is I store user demographic information, say your name, your gender, your you know, whatever. That would be stored in the users table, like a typical MySQL table. You might ingest that into HBase. And also your rating information. Now the other thing that I store is the categories information. And the categories information is a, this is a batch computation to first seed this table that is go over all the 10 million ratings and compute for each category the number of ratings, the sum, and the sum squared. So what that allows me to do in my scoring real time is compute standard deviation based on the global standard deviation, because I can do the local one pretty straightforward. So now, as users are rating movies, two places are being updated. One, that user record. So if, Jack, you updated the rating of a movie, um, your rating you've added a new rating to your tape, to your column. Furthermore, that rating is contributing to the global numbers. So as users, maybe say a comedy, maybe comedy's fallen out of favor, and now what that means is results will start to change over time as this gets populated. So this gets, these are just counters in HBase um, for implementation details. These are just straight counters. So you're literally incrementing a rating by five or by two, so it's an atomic increment. And these are then read in at real, in real time to compute these boosts. Does that sort of help? So the, the user changed their specific interest. Yes. And that'll have a high weight on what their results should be. Yes. And it'll have a, 
eventually have a slight effect on yes. the global results. Yes. And so, then that's something you do in, when do you update that? What kind of cycle? Well, so that, cycle? that's in real time. That's, that's in real time because, because the um, global stuff, so let's assume for a second I, we don't have any caching on the HBase side. Let's say my freshness policy is always freshen, which means every single time I want to do a personalized search, I always recompute. Now, the end, that, that's one answer, which means always read this and always recompute standard deviation, and then that will rejigger your z-score. The other option is, well, maybe I don't want to do always freshen. Maybe it's freshen when I update a new rating. Well, in this case, I still would have done that. Or I could do time. I could say, we'll recompute every 15 minutes, those types. But in either case, as, soon as, as long as the scoring function is reading this table, you'll get the latest information. Um, previously, my, when I first built this demo, I was, I was uh, recomputing the category information and storing them as a TSV, and then having Solar read this in as a local map. But then I realized, well, that's not fun. Let's make it real, real time by using HBase as a map. And that's what this demo is. Okay, so you, you do have to update Solar uh, every time something changes anywhere? No. Not unless, not unless I want that to influence the non-personalized popularity. Okay, so I mean, so, but some of the stuff that's in the Solar is based on all of the users, right? Correct. So if so I, a user makes one little change, that's what I was thinking, that you wouldn't yes. need to update Solar right away because yes. it's only going to be a tiny impact on the global result. Only if, only if you care about the non-personalized search. So when I go, okay. so when I go to um, this view, this view, this ranking, is based on text and time of the movie release date and the global rating information. The global rating, which yes. included that one user who just Correct. changed Correct, absolutely. Okay. That would have to be done through an indexing pipeline in Solar, whether it be a near real-time index or your batch indexing or whatever you choose. That would be happening then. Okay, and then you're, you're actually doing a toolkit here, so the customer who's using this would then decide how Correct. What rate they want it. Yes. Do. Okay, yes. thanks. Absolutely. Why don't you take the initial ranking, like from Google or Bing, which know from, uh, from like uh, tens million of users what are most popular? So the answer is, the question is, why don't I take the ratings from Google? The thing with Google, though, is I don't know individual, I don't know individual ratings. Um, that would help on the, to me, on the non-personalized because that's for the general relevancy problem, which, which is still important, but for my, for my demo purposes, I didn't really care too much about. But the case I was really focusing on was what happens when I enable a user-level personalization. So you say, well, for user Boris, uh, what does the ranking look like? Uh, you're right, for, for fixing the general case, I'd probably have to do something more sophisticated. But I just want to keep it, and for the other reason, I want to keep it confined to a local data set that you don't need the internet for, other than the download stuff. So, no more questions? Thank you, Amit. Thank you for your time. <laughs>